Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey, hey, folks, it's a great day to have a great day. And then I'm your host, Shay Keister, and I am very excited to talk about one of my favorite topics, genetic testing. So we have Jed Hutchinson and Ryan Ludvigson on the show today. It is July 11th when we are recording this, and we are going to cover all the bases. We're going to talk about the Zoetis Inherit Select program, and we're going to talk about Ryan's experience with using it with himself and his customers. We're also going to talk about Jed's experience helping producers use it. They are going to talk about what they see um, as far as people who are marketing their heifers who use this test and We're also going to talk about what happens, you know, do you need it? Do you not need it? What do feedlots want? Where where do you see the return on investment? How much does it cost? And we're just going to dive into all of that and also talk about finding direction in your herd. You know, is your herd pretty uniform? Is it actually really, is there a wide array of genetics in there? So we're going to talk about all those things, how you figure that out and what it means once you do find that out. So That is what we're talking about today. It's a great episode. Before we dive into that, if you have ever wanted to start a podcast, I'm here to let you know that I'm now taking on -on one-on-one clients. I very limited spots, but if you want to work with me one-on-one, I can take you from ground zero. You just have that idea that's been on your heart for a while to start a podcast all the way up to getting those downloads, seeing those numbers increase in six weeks. So I have a six weeks, six week, one-to-one coaching program. You have to definitely put your own time into it as well, but you get to work with me one-on-one and we can get you published up and running and make it a sustainable podcast so that you aren't burnt out by it um, and are done after 10 episodes because that happens to too many people and I don't want that. So if you want more information on that, head to my website, casualcattleconversations.com and find the contact page, and then you can send me a message there. But with that, let's talk about genetics. Well, good afternoon, Ryan and Jed. It is great to have you on the show today, and uh, I'm pretty excited to talk about some genetics. But before we dive into that, I always think it's important that people know who we're talking with or list who they're listening to, I guess. I'm the ones talking to you guys. So to start off, I'll have each of you introduce yourself. So Jed, let's start with you. Kind of what are you doing in the beef industry today and what kind of brings you onto the show? Well, yeah, thank you. And thanks for having us. Uh, Jed Hutchison, I actually work for Zoetis and the uh, beef genetics side of their business. Uh, Zoetis is really kind of known for the animal health industry and and kind of that piece and what they play a role in feed yards and boba shield and all of those other things. But but we also have a pretty big portfolio, I guess you could say, in the uh, genetics world. And so I manage the genetics, the beef genetics business for Zoetis in the Western U.S. And I uh, I live out in Idaho. Well, thank you. And Ryan, how about you? I guess I kind of know who you are already, but <laughs> everyone else might not. So what are, give people a little bit of background about yourself. Glad to be here today, Shay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm Ryan Ludvigson. I'm from Billings, Montana. Uh, myself and my family, we're, we're a part of Ludvigson Stock Farms. Uh, we're Red Angus and Red Sim Angus seed stock producers from there. And uh, But we also have some sister companies that help with marketing for our customers. The Orion Beef Group is a uh, uh, really a feeder cattle uh, and fed cattle kind of uh, marketing group. And then we also have RL Cattle company, which is really our commercial end of, of marketing kind of commercial uh, replacement females and bred females. Well, awesome. And uh, this is another point for Team Red Angus for guests who have been on the show. <laughs> it is. That's great. <laughs> Not a Red Angus podcast, but I do find quite a few people in the Red Angus side to be on here. So to start off, we are talking about Inherit Select today. So Maybe, Jed, this might be one for you. Can you talk about what Inherit Select is? Give a little bit of background on what the product is itself. Yeah, that's a great question. I think when we first talk about genetics or genetically enhanced EPDs, most people want to think about the seed stock industry and the bulls that they buy and have they been 50K tested. 
But today, we now have a test that's available for commercial cattle as well. And so not only bulls, but particularly commercial females. And so it gives you a three different economic indexes, 20 different traits that, that kind of help you as you start making those decisions on which heifers we're going to keep. And so in the past, you know, as cattlemen, we've had certain things and know our cattle and all of these other tools that we've used to to select those replacement females. Now we have an actual DNA test where we can look at those individuals and tell you which one of those are the most economical and which one of those are the most advantageous for specific traits. What are those three indexes or can you give some examples of what you said, 20 traits that you look at? So I'm not going to ask you to list them all off unless you think you can (laughs) get them all in one shot, but what are some of those that producers can look at after they have the test results back? So, so when we start talking about the economic indexes, um, again, there's three of them. One looks at her, that female as just a feeder animal. And so it's called the Zoetis feed yard um, index. And, and so it's going to look at traits like feed intake and marbling and ribeye and some of those things that, that are really important on the feeder side. On the flip side of that, it's going to look at her just as a cow. What is her ability to come into our herd and be productive as a female? So fertility is a really big piece of that one. Um, calving yeast is a really big piece of that one. Docility is, is another piece that, that all of us are really concerned with anymore. And then the, the third one is her as an overall individual. So the complete cow, what does she look like, including all the feeder and carcass merit and also the fertility and the docility and, and all of those other traits as well, her mature size, her milk, all of those things included into one kind of overall, what what does she bring to the table? Okay. So, so what does the process kind of look like to implement this? Ryan, this is something you've used? We have. And in fact, uh, you know, we, we tested about 1900 50 commercial females, mostly from our bull customers, but kind of a broad spectrum of of commercial red Angus producers, as well as uh, a few red Sim Angus uh, commercial operations as well. Um, you know, it's it's very similar to what we do in the seed stock industry. We, we uh, you know, we utilize these tissue samplers uh, from Allflex. We collect, we collect the tissue samples out of the ears, and then we, we send those in uh, to Zoetis. To be processed under uh, under their inherent select program, um, and it it gives us a plethora of information. It, it's it's really we get the same amount of information that we have when we're selecting bulls and replacement heifers in our you know in our seed stock uh, production herd as well. And so it's a it's a wealth of information. It really is uh, really unbelievable that we can have this kind of information on on commercial cattle. You know where there hasn't been a lot of performance data uh, collected in the past. Uh, and no pedigree information. And it would be surprising how accurate they are, you know, with their DNA samples. Well, it really sounds like an opportunity opportunity to be more proactive, which I think is something that we all need to strive for. So when do you typically recommend that people take these samples? Is it at weaning? Is it before weaning? Like how much time do people need to get results back and start making decisions? When's kind of that prime time to take those tissue samples? I think it just kind of depends on the operation and how often you're going to have your hands on them. Some some producers like to do it at birth, right? It's not nothing's going to change from the time she's a day old versus a yearling. But I I guess in my personal opinion, to me, you still need to go evaluate and look at those females. This is just another tool. It's not a live and die by the sword. I think it really just helps us to get more information on those individuals. And so in my opinion, once you kind of sort through your cattle, this is a set of heifers we're we're thinking we want to keep, or or even before that, we're getting ready to bang vaccinates, probably the ideal time, because a lot of times we sort those cattle based on size and, and maybe some of the cattle that have the most genetic merit, maybe just be a couple months younger or a month younger or whatever, and so there's that little bit of variance, but she may have the most 
potential to offer. And so it really just kind of depends, but but Bing's vaccination for this this test is probably an ideal time. Okay. So what you're saying is, you know, we're not throwing phenotype out the window. Like we're still looking at structure, making sure everything's good there, but still like once we made sure we've sorted out those heifers that are maybe not structurally sound, then let's look at the genetic merit side of it and see, okay, what qualities that those females actually possess. In my opinion, and, and I think it's to be nice to hear from Ryan as well, but I'm the guy selling it and I, I like pretty cattle. I like to be able to go look at cattle and, and be proud of what I look like or what I'm looking at. So yeah, I, I definitely think they got to have those traits and characteristics that, that we want in our herd phenotypically. And absolutely, especially out in Idaho where I live, I mean, we turn out on BLM and a lot of really big country. Like she has to be able to go out and make a living and travel and, and be able to do all of those functions properly and without hindrance, despite what her genetic potential may be. What, what's kind of your thoughts? on that? Yeah, I would say, you know, I mean, just from our instance, our, our sample size is fairly large. We, we mm-hmm. tested over 1900 of these heifers. And I'll tell you that two heifers that look exactly like phenotypically are not, are not the same heifers genetically. And I tell you what, with that added information, you're able to know which heifers you maybe want to keep as replacements and which ones you don't. Uh, where, you know, in the past, really the only thing we've, we've really had you know, as far as information on heifers to decide what we're keeping for replacements or what we're purchasing, you know, for bred females is based a lot on what that particular cow that heifer was out of and probably some phenotypic, maybe a little bit of performance data. You can see if, you know, if she's a nice growthy heifer, if she's kind of a a smaller heifer or things like that, uh, you don't really have a lot of information. And and you'd probably select females that look similar from phenotypic, uh, a phenotypic standpoint but then when you start looking at their, their DNA profile, there's vast differences in a lot of these heifers. And so, you know, I think I think it's it's crucial to have this added information just to make your operations that much better. Absolutely. And yeah, you do have a large sample size where you've used that. So, you know, you have commercial producers who <clears throat> say they they get these results back, they have those 20 traits and those three end indexes to look at. Now what? Like what decisions can they make now that they have that information? Because yeah, data is cool, but the point of data is that we use it to make sound yeah. decisions. So now what? Now that they have these information and they can kind of look at them as an overall female, they can see if they're more terminal or more maternal. Now what decisions can they make off of this? Yeah, we're Ryan and I this week are here in Steamboat Springs and it's it's unbelievable what these cattle are going to cost, right? It's unbelievable when you look at what these replacement females are going to cost this year. And so how do we know that we're, what we're paying an all-time high for is really what we're, we're after? How do, we, how do we better understand what we're trying to buy? And, and honestly, when you look at things statistically, you've got a bell curve, right? And so 50% of them are going to be average or below average. I mean, that's just the statistics, the, the reality of the deal. And so in my opinion, it's not necessarily always trying to just capture the top end, but which one of these are going to cost me more money? Because you talk to any rancher and one of the biggest expenses that he has is developing these females that fall out that first or second year. And so if we can help them mitigate a little bit of that piece, and, and move the bottom of the bell curve from here up to here, now we can feel a little bit better about what we're purchasing these individuals for. And now we can know the traits that we're actually trying to accentuate within our herd and know exactly how to go about doing that, would be my opinion. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think we lean in our, you know, in our operation, we lean a lot more towards using the indexes. And then we'll tweak things with the individual EPDs. But, I, you know, I think even in a commercial situation, and we would suggest that to our commercial customers, that they use the indexes first. And then if they have particular, you know, traits within their herd that they need to improve, you know, say uh, they feel like they're a little lower on milk, or maybe they're a little too high on milk. 
you know, they may go in and select those cattle that do really well index wise, but then maybe tweak things on an individual trait basis. Uh, and so, you know, I think the, the use of the index is, is a lot more highly accurate for moving uh, cattle operations in profitable, you know, into in more profitable situations. And, uh, you know, the indexes are there, you know, it's been proven time and time again, they're, they're eight times more accurate and accurate at really kind of getting you to your goals than uh, selecting individual traits. Yeah, that's a great point. I think a lot of people get a little worked up when they think about all 20 of those traits and how do I really manage all that? And so, yeah, it just kind of takes the guesswork out of it, and helps you be more consistent in the direction you're trying to drive your herd. For sure. But... So what is there or what's available for resources as far as helping commercial producers understand these indexes, these traits, and the data that they get back. Because I know EPDs have been out for a long time. Some people have been, a lot of, I know a lot of commercial producers who are very good at sorting through that information. But sometimes when we look at a new set of numbers, or if it's anything new, it can be overwhelming. So what resources are out there to help people understand what they're looking at when they get their results back? So certainly in the beginning, right there, we have websites and we have those things. Inheritprogress.com is one that you can go and learn a little bit more about it. But at Zoetis, we have reps across the country. Mm -hmm. And so once you get ready to kind of start making that initial step, we'll step in, we'll help you get those testing supplies, we'll help you if you need help testing, if you've never done anything with, with you know, the all flex tissue samplers or whatever it might be, we're, we're more than willing to help kind of walk you through those steps and then certainly once we start getting results back you know myself one of my colleagues we have a veterinarian different staff on hand that would love to kind of sit down and go through those numbers with you and help you really digest and understand what you have there and then if there's there's help wanted in the direction to go and then then i think there's reputable operations like ludwigson's that are more than happy and very knowledgeable when it comes to, to DNA samples and, and how that all looks and helping them kind of walk through that process and, and evaluate their, their results as well. So Ryan, I have a question. You said, you know, you've done this test with some of your commercial customers, right? Were they shocked when they got some of their results back or was it kind of what they expected? I mean, was it a lot to digest in terms of really, that's how that heifer performs? Like, were there, was there a lot of that? Like, how did you navigate that? I think, I think, folks, I, I think the thing that probably is most surprising is that they do have variation in their herd. You know, they're not necessarily as homogeneous as they think they are. And so I think, but then it starts making sense to them, you know, and, and really, you know, we, we stress people using EPDs and indexes in, in selecting their goals. And so they're able to really kind of apply that then to their replacement females. And I think they do, they do see some. Now, I mean, to be honest, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's probably finding the lowest third in most cases for most of these people. You know, it's, it's more of a culling strategy than, than a selection strategy. You know, and, and I would say that makes the most sense is you kind of keep, you know, you keep pulling off the bottom. And as you do that, you kind of keep bringing you know, the average up in your herd because you keep, you know, making that lower, you know, that lower part of that herd moving up is what you do from an index standpoint. And so, you know, most of our customers are real familiar. You know, we print a lot of indexes, you know, along with, you know, we, we you know, we actually take in samples and we process the samples for our customers through the Uh, But we do that also with the Leachman dollar profit indexes. And so people are real familiar. We've been you know, on that program for close to 15 years. And so people are real familiar, you know, with those indexes in our catalogs and things like that. So then when they get those indexes on their replacement females, you know, they're they're fairly well accustomed to seeing those and to be able to use them. I might add to Shay, you know, on top of the indexes and the traits that we get back, they also get breed composition is one of the things. And so they really get this in-depth dive, this look into actually what their herd is, 
really comprised of that we, we think we have in our minds what they look like but it's interesting or it's been interesting to me to find that you know when i first start talking to them they're they're angus to the core and then we get these breed comps back and there's some perford in there or something else and they're like they're they're shocked at first and then the more they think about it they're like you know what my grandpa had bought a handful of them bulls clear back whenever you know what i mean mm -hmm. and, and they had mm -hmm. no idea the impact that that handful of bulls obviously had had in their herd if those were the only bulls that honestly were bought does that make sense and so that's really kind of interesting and then the other piece to it is is the sire trace or kind of matching each calf to a particular sire so we go spend 10 12 14 thousand whatever it might be on those bulls we can identify which one of those bulls is actually getting the cows bred and then which one of those individuals or individuals you know multiple sires are producing those best calves and so that can help us as we go to ryan sale or whoever across the country and kind of have a little bit more knowledge even on the sire on that buying piece there as well i think absolutely you know i think i think everybody thinks that you know when they turn their bulls out they're going to get 20 calves out of each bull and and i think what they tend to find in, in these programs is that there's some bulls that are that are producing 50 calves a year and some bulls maybe only a couple. And so it does, I mean, and I think that's, you know, in essence, that's why you kind of find out that maybe, you know, these herds aren't as homogeneous as you think, just because there probably is some more sire influence than people thought in the past. The, <clears throat> the sire influence is interesting. That's something I take for granted with our seed stock operation because we test everything for parentage, right? But then right. my fiance and I have commercial cattle and those are multiple sire groups. So that's kind of something I was like, huh, well, you know, you, unless you're testing, you don't know exactly which bulls are actually paying for themselves. Um, right. So there's something definitely I've taken advantage of, I think on the seed stock side <laughs> is having that information. But um, so the question that my audience always likes to know, and I always think is important to ask when we're asking, especially commercial cattle producers to buy into something is, where does that return on investment come into play? And we've talked about a few different things, but we haven't necessarily directly addressed the question. So where does that payback come for people buying these tests, running the tests, the samples, and using that information? What is that return on investment? Where can they see that when they're looking at their numbers and their operation. Sure. No, that's fine. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, and I'm probably stepping on Jed a little bit here, but you know, I think um, it, it roughly costs uh, $30 a head to, uh, to do the select inherit test. Um, but I, I would say if you are going to single trait select for a lot of these cattle and not use the index, the one thing you could emphasize is their fertility EPD. And uh, it's really groundbreaking what Zoetis has done with that fertility EPD. And I think, as we all know, that longer the longer we can keep a cow in the herd, uh, the more time she'll pay off. And I think if you can increase, not necessarily the age, but that productivity over the years, where you don't have a lot of young females falling out of the herd, uh, costs a lot to either purchase a bred female or to background and develop a bred female. Uh, obviously, we've got a lot of front-loaded costs there. Uh, and the longer we can have that female in the herd to really repay that investment, that's really where I see the return on investment in this test. Uh, the test is is fairly, in, in essence, it's fairly cheap. If you can find females that you can at least have in the herd for six or seven years minimum, where you're not really losing a lot of females after your year two or year three. And so, you know, I think the return is the fact that you can keep, you know, you've got the ability to select those females that are going to stay in the herd longer. I, I totally agree. I think that truly is what the advantage is, is that we can eliminate that bottom little piece there. Because again, we're, we're going to see record prices this week, right? And uh, I'm going to name drop a little bit, but there's going to be a set of cattle that sell tomorrow, Willis's in Cokeville, Wyoming. They've been testing with us now for probably 
gosh, from the beginning. So maybe 10 years, eight, 10 years, commercial cattle. And um, if their cattle don't top the sale tomorrow, I will, they'll, they'll be right there with any of them. And so even though they go and buy the absolute very best bulls that money can buy, they still have found value in continually testing these cattle because it just gives them so much more insight not only on that individual female herself, but the bulls that they're trying to buy and the direction that they're really trying to go and those indexes, just like Ryan said earlier, just staying true to that force and letting it work itself out. They have absolutely seen the value and continually, not just in the beginning, but continued clear through 10 years later, they still feel like it's it's making them money. So what types of, commercial producers are you think going to benefit the most from this? Is it people who are marketing bred heifers? Is it more people who are just um, keeping their own replacements? I mean, is there a type of producer that you are specifically thinking about when you're like, yes, this test will help you? I think it's deep. All of the above. If you're buying cattle, if you're buying replacements, and you can go to Ludwigs and sell this fall and you can look at their their numbers and know that they have the characteristics that you're trying to implement in your herd, that's an advantage. If you're keeping replacements and input costs and all these other things are so high and we can eliminate that little piece on the bottom, that's an advantage. I think long-term cow-calf operations, you know, that that are in it for the long haul. You know, I think by doing this, it's just another step of of really just being on the cutting edge of doing things. You know, purchasing bulls with EPDs uh, from really good operations, you know, having good health programs, having good land steward programs. It's just another step now. And it's just that it's this technology is available. And, you know, it's available in a practical format that you can really utilize. And by not really, you know, making that investment, um, you know, I mean, obviously with, with higher cattle prices the next couple of years, you've got that opportunity to really kind of use some of that extra profit, you know, to invest in yourself and invest in your cow herd, um, which is going to pay long-term dividends is really what it's going to do. So when we're thinking about when producers are going to see the benefits and return on investment from this, you've both talked about a lot of great points and how it's valuable, but is that something where people see these benefits within that first year of investing, or is it something where it's more of a long game? I guess it just depends on really what your goal is, but I think you're going to find benefit in it regardless of how your operation, you know, if you're a short term or a long term, because it's still going to help you give that, give you knowledge in making those decisions to be more profitable. So if if you can, if you can pick a golf team by first asking the, your potential teammate, you know, what's your, you know, do you play golf? What's your, handicap, right? If you can ask all of these questions before you even start to play golf, you're going to be pretty tough to beat, right? If you can identify those individuals that are pretty handy when it comes to swinging the stick, it's the same in the cattle deal. If we can identify those individuals before we have to start forking out the real money, regardless if you're going to keep them a year or three years, I think there's there's still savings there. There's still an advantage to have that knowledge to give you the direction that you want to go. Yeah, I kind of look at it from the standpoint that if you don't, you, you, you know, I think you've got to start at some point. Okay. So maybe you don't have short term. I think you probably could have short term. If if you've done a good job buying genetics, you're probably going to find, you know, that probably you're going to test fairly well. Okay. And the thing we haven't really talked about here, I mean, we've mostly talked about replacement females, but really you can use that information off your replacement females. It should mirror any steers that you'd be selling. And so you could market those cattle based on that because for the most part, 
it's going to be about it, it's going to correlate at least at 0.9 or higher that the steers are going to be very correlated to the females on, on large enough groups and then say you only have 100 cows your steers are still going to are still going to pretty much mirror or mimic your heifers and so you've got that opportunity to select if you haven't really been doing a very good job purchasing genetics or haven't really utilized the tools available um, i'm going to tell you that in the future we're probably going to see a widening in these counts because as people have access to this information, especially feedlots, you know, purchasing cattle, they're going to utilize they're going to utilize that information in their in their purchasing needs. And I think we're going to see some segmentation in prices for those people that have purchased good genetics as opposed to people doing average or less than average. And so, as far as long, I mean, I think there's short term and there's long term gain, but I think. I think every year you put it off, you're just going to be that much farther behind in this competitive cattle business. What do you define as a good job of selecting genetics? You've brought that up a couple times. So what do you define as, you know, doing a good job of selecting genetics? I, I think in my mind, it's those people that are util, utilizing a balanced approach. Okay. Cattle that not only grow well, and have good average daily gains to cattle that have acceptable carcass levels. I'm not saying you got to select the highest, but I think you have to be well above average for what's available in a breed, either, you know, Angus, Red Angus, uh, Charlay, uh, Semental, whatever breed that you're dealing with. You know, if you select those cattle that are above average and select them on a balanced trade approach, that's more than likely you know, you've been doing a good job of, of selecting or even utilizing genetics. You know, some people, you know, those people that maybe aren't even utilizing, you know, the tools that are available from a genetic standpoint, you know, um, and, and not having any selection pressure, you know, they're probably not going to be above average in the beef industry. But if you're above average in the beef industry, that's a pretty good place to be, you know, as far as a base level and a benchmark level, you know, and then that gives you every opportunity to really kind of double down and select better genetics, you know, as you go forward. Yeah, and I, I think consistency, right? If if you're looking at your cattle and they are just inconsistent, there's you've probably struggled, right? There's probably some room for improvement. And once you can start making a very consistent quality product that is uniform and right, that's that's really what we're all after in this industry. And that's where we get beat up the most is that inconsistency. And so once we can start really making these uniform, consistent individuals, then I think we start winning. So from a big picture perspective, how do you think this will impact the beef industry? Because genetic testing isn't new. It's been out for a long time, especially in the seed stock space, but even in the commercial space, I know commercial producers who have been using it for quite a few years, but it seems like there's more of a push for it lately. So how do you think this is going to change the beef industry as we know it? I'll take a stab at it first and then Ryan can clean up. I honestly could see in the future cattle buyers using a genetic slide. You know, when we, we market cattle today and we have this weight slide, if they're over, we slide them. But really, the as competitive as we're getting for these feeders, and we have more plants coming to market that want these cattle, especially out here in the West. I mean, we've never had this much competition and we've got the least amount of cattle that we've had in how many years. And so if these cattle can be tested and we can go to that producer and say, hey, um, I will give you X for your cattle. But if they test on the high side of this deal and they are phenomenal, I'm willing to pay you more money for it. But if they don't, then I'm going to slide you the other way. I'm not saying that's tomorrow. I'm not saying that's really what will happen, but I really think that genetics is going to play a huge, huge role in all of these different pressures that we have in this industry. And yet we're still, the demand is crazy, right? We, we still have this huge demand and this, this huge need. How do we be more economic? But, but I, I, I think maybe a, a genetic slide where we, we use our numbers to help market them and get premiums. And we're kind of going that direction today, but, but where it's a really bought in thing and these cattle buyers are using those 
numbers to help them make decisions and what they're willing to pay for a set of cattle. I think as we look, you know, I'm going to look at it from more of a, you know, this large perspective that you're kind of asking for, Shay. It, I, as we look at the industry, the beef industry, and the progress that's been made in the last 50 or 60 years, you know, we can point at particular things that that we've seen make progress, right? Uh, one was crossbreeding. You know, in the early 1970s, we saw a lot of continental influence into the United States, and, and we saw that crossbreeding made a huge impact on the industry. You know, I think um, EPDs have made a huge impact on the industry. We saw that, uh, you know, when EPDs really came into effect, it took a long time for them to be embraced, but, but I mean, you can point to that and say, we made progress in the beef industry. You know, I think Carcass Ultrasound is another, you know, another uh, particular technology that, that was implemented that, that made a huge difference in the industry. If we look today, compared to really when ultrasound came in in about 2000, late 1990s, you know, where we are today with the percentage of cattle grading prime and, and upper choice, I mean, we've made huge progress. And that was due to that. I think we're going to look back someday and we're going to say, this is a this is a huge stepping stone for the beef industry by those people that embrace DNA profiling and DNA technology to move their herds farther and faster. And I think the industry is going to look back and say, they're going to be able to point to that no different than crossbreeding or EPDs or ultrasound or selection indexes. You know, I think when we look back, this is going to be one of the major things that help make beef producers more progressive and more profitable. And it's been a game changer in the dairy industry. Look what the dairy industry has done and how quickly they've moved their cattle forward in a positive manner. So, yeah, absolutely. I, and I think, you know, to add to that, we're pretty hamstring in the beef industry compared to other species. And when we look from a competitive protein, you know, uh, portion here, you know, we're, we're in such a slow generational turnover. We've got to have some things that we can make the right selection because, you know, it takes us a long time to make change. And this is going to speed things up to make rapid change by knowing really what we have uh, compared to pork and poultry. Absolutely. So as we wrap up today, do either of you have any final thoughts that you want to share? Mm. I'm just going to make a plug. We, you know, we've embraced this technology from, a, from our seed stock standpoint of our company. You know, we've been utilizing it for over 15 years and we have made such significant progress and we see so much accuracy. Uh, when we're selling bulls today, we really don't ever get that call. One of the particular traits that most bull buyers want to know is, am I going to get a calving in this bull? And am I going to have calving problems next spring? I, I cannot remember in the last 10 years getting a call from someone that said, I had a lot of calving problems with this bull. And I would say from a single trait selection standpoint, just for simple reasoning, is that that DNA is highly accurate. And, and we feel like we don't really get a lot of changes. And in the herd sires that we use AI to produce the next generation of our seed stock, we're not seeing a lot of difference in those cattle either. This DNA makes these cattle highly active. And I would tell you that once you institute that into these commercial herds, you're going to see a lot less variation and you're going to see a lot less surprises as you take care of things on that female side of things. And so I, I just think from a standpoint of, of, of being more progressive, and being more profitable. It, it, it's really a very cheap investment for the commercial county. And you're exactly right. I mean, this hasn't been available to just anybody and everybody. It has been a seed stock kind of a thing that we've been able to look at their DNA, DNA profile. And so for these guys to really be able to invest in their herd and, and really get an in-depth look. And, and it's not necessarily to to rank your cattle against your neighbors or anybody else across the country, really it gives you an opportunity to create a baseline. And then you've got some, some direction and some ideas of what you can do to help move that set of cattle forward. And I think that's where the real opportunity lies, is creating a baseline and okay, this is where we're gonna start. This is where we're going. This is how we're gonna go about it. Here we go. 
All righty. Well, thank you both for being on the show today and uh, sharing your knowledge and experiences with everyone else out there. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.